So before we get there, uh, just a few general comments. Uh, you know, my opinion, and particularly in children, again, data review and adjustment should be done frequently, like every four to six weeks in children, maybe much less than that in adults, obviously, because they don't change that much. But if you're dealing with children, uh, I think it, it, it should not last more than six weeks at a time, and then the data should be reviewed and the settings should be adjusted uh, for both the basal race as well as the ISF. And primarily for the ISF, because the insulin to carb ratio, in my experience, does not change as frequently as the ISF. It's the ISF that changes dramatically. That's very different between adults and children. And then even with closed loops, uh, we still need to optimize these settings. Uh, so I hear a lot of people saying, you know, with closed loop system that's going to adjust uh, blood sugars continuously all day, do we really need to optimize the insulin to carb ratio and the ISF in the end? My answer is, is yes, because uh, the, the, the better the, those ratios are set, the more effective the closed loop system is going to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, remembering that, most closed loop systems are going to predict what the blood sugar is going to be in the near future, in a few hours from now, and then calculating how much extra insulin do you need. And that calculation is taking into account what the ISF really is, the ISF that we told it should be. The ISF, and this is important to remember, should follow the basal pattern because it, they both reflect the insulin sensitivity. Uh, as the name indicates, insulin sensitivity factor. As we have seen in our webinar about basal rates, that the basal rates uh, during the day follow a particular pattern where at certain times of the day you need more insulin and at certain times of the day you need less insulin because you're uh, more sensitive to insulin, so you need less basal rate. And the same thing applies to the insulin sensitivity factor. It should not be the same all day, 24 hours. When you're more sensitive to insulin, you need a weaker ISF, and when you're resistant to insulin, you need a stronger ISF. All right, what about the concept of pure events? Uh, again, we're going to spend just a couple of minutes on this because it's really important. Uh, in order to assess and calculate ISF and ICR, we need to look for those pure events. And there are four different criteria uh, that will make a complete or, an, or a really good pure event or a pure, pure event. Uh, one is that's the single dose for a meal or a correction. Uh, and the second is that it's preceded by a stable CGM trace for at least one hour. So CGM tracing meaning blood sugar that's not rising and it's not dropping, it's just stable. It doesn't have to be in range, it can be anywhere, uh, but at least it's stable for a minimum of one hour. And then the third criteria is that it's followed by no other events for three to four hours after that. So there's no more snacking after that, no carbs, no boluses, no corrections, and no exercise. And you can getting the sense how difficult it is to actually find those pure events, and particularly if you're dealing with children. But we do the best we can. Uh, and then Finally, it's a good stable basal rate in the background. So the changes in the basal rate are not contributing to the changes in the blood sugar. It's purely an effect of the bolus that we're giving. And that's why, that's how we're gonna focus on is the bolus enough or too much or too little. So we need to have that basal background to be steady and not contributing to the changes in the blood sugar. All right, what about this one, pure event? Uh, I'm gonna give you five seconds to look at this to see if you can identify a pure event in this slide right here. This is a full day, 24 hour of one person who is not using a closed loop system. All right, five seconds are over. So uh, let's see if we have a, a pure event. I, I would say, yes, we do. We have not a 100% pure event, but it's an event with a correction bolus right here. This is the tiny one, but it's really helpful and useful for doing our calculations. We have a correction bolus. We have a steady CGM in the previous two or three hours, and then nothing else is happening. The patient was still sleeping because it was her father who gave her the bolus at 4.40 in the morning, and then VG was dropping and there was nothing else happening. Again, it didn't quite reach the three to four hours post bolus of no other events. This was only about two hours and 15 minutes. She woke up and ate breakfast, but that's okay. We can still use this information here, which basically tells us that, that 
uh, this bolus kind of started to work and was working okay. And if we had let it go for another hour before she ate breakfast, it probably would have hit the target maybe even a little bit lower. Remember, this dotted line is always 70 and this dotted line is 180. And that's the, 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 the range that we aim for here. And anything that's in this range is going to be in green and anything above is purple. All right, how about another event? Uh, for those of you who identified this bolus as a pure event, good for you because that is another pure event that would be very useful to look at. Uh, so we have a bolus for carbs right here. Plus sugar went up and went back down and went back down to baseline. And for four plus hours, there was nothing else going on. No other events, no other boluses. And we have a nice steady basal uh, that's actually working pretty much with no adjustments, no uh, changes, except for a little suspension here because she was dropping a little bit too close uh, or too fast. So suspended the pump, resumed the pump within 10 minutes. So no major changes in the basal and a good solid working basal rate because we can see how nicely working it is during the night. And if it's working this well during the night, I would expect it to be working fairly well during the day as well. So we have a good, uh, good criteria for this event to be a pure event to calculate the insulin to, to carb ratio. Was this bolus enough to cover the 48 grams? We're gonna get, get back to that in a second. And here's another event right here. Again, this was not a completely pure event, but we have a one hour preceded uh, CGM tracing that's steady. And then we have a single bolus, but it's a component of a bolus for the carbs as well as a bolus for a correction because her blood sugar was high. So combine those two together, we have a single bolus and then we have nothing else going on for the next five hours. Uh, and then at the end of the five hours, uh, the blood sugar actually starts to go steady right here. So the effect of this bolus finished right here at about four and a half hours. Again, we're gonna get, get back to that in just a second. So let's get back to this, which is trying to dissect it and decipher it. that very first one here to calculate the ISF. As I said, if we uh, hover over that, it tells me that the starting blood sugar was 162 at 4.41 a.m. And based on an ISF of 35 and a target blood sugar of 100, it delivered 1.77 units. And the starting blood sugar of 162 and two and a half hours later, it was 108. Uh, but like I said, if we let it go for another hour, it probably would have gone down to like 95 or let's say 92 to make the calculations easy. So let's say this would have been 92, 162 minus 92, which is the effect of this bolus of 1.77. So we have 70 point drop with 1.77 units. And if we do the math, that's roughly about an ISF of 40. 1.77 drops you 70 points, one unit drops you 40 points, so that means the ISF for this patient at this time of the day would be somewhere around 40. Uh, so we can just let go and say, we can't make a decision at a change based on just a single event. We have to find three or four different events, do the same calculation, take the average uh, result that we're coming up with and say, it looks like your ISF is a little bit too strong here at 35 at four in the morning. So maybe we should change it to 40 if we have that consistent finding. I, I, I follow a general rule, which is that the younger the child and the smaller the dose, the less insulin duration, the shorter insulin duration. Uh, so when somebody's taking 25 units of insulin, that's going to last four to six hours. Uh, when somebody's taking 0.7 unit of bolus, well, that's barely gonna last two hours because it gets absorbed very fast from under the skin and reaches the blood circulation. Uh, so generally speaking, I would go for roughly about two to three hours in children. If we're talking adolescents and post-adolescents and young adults, we're going for three to four hours, sometimes longer if the doses are big. But a quick look at the CGM tracing in tight pool and just, just going over those pure events, one will easily find when did that bolus start working, when did it peak, and when did it actually end. And I think we've you know, shown, uh, hopefully I've shown a couple of examples where you can see that here's the bolus and then four hours later, the CGM tracing instead of starting to drop and then it becomes flat after that. That's a good indication the bolus has finished working. And that's a good indication where you should stop looking at this. But generally, I would look for the following three hours 
as a, as a, as a big ballpark three hours after the bonus. This one, however, uh, at, at first you, you would think that this is not a good one to look at, but in fact, it's actually quite helpful. There's an opportunity here for evaluating an ISF at 9 p.m. This is now four hours after the last meal. There was a disconnection with the CGM, but it picked up. Yes, it's not exactly a stable CGM before, but there is a correction given here. Not a correction bolus, but a correction action by the closed loop system that increased the basal rate right here to say, I'm gonna give you extra insulin. And prior to that, we have almost three hours with no changes in the basal and it's working on its own. And then the following two and a half hours, there was no changes in the basal either. You know, there was just tiny little blip here, but we could ignore it, that's minimal. But the, the effect here is that this is almost like a bolus uh, of a certain amount that resulted in a drop of blood sugar from here to here. So let's, let's see how that works out. Uh, if we hover over that, we will see that the, the, the increase in the basal right here actually uh, was running at 2.4 units an hour. Now we're gonna do it right here. The temp basal was 2.4 units an hour. The scheduled basal was 0 0.6 units an hour. So the extra basal was 1.8 unit an hour. So the extra basal was running at about 1.8 unit per hour, but it only worked for about 20 minutes. So really this is calculating that the additional insulin that was given during this 20 minutes by the closed loop system was an extra 0.6 units. So it's almost like giving a bolus of 0.6 units and that 0.6 units dropped the blood sugar from, 70, from 160 to 86. And if we do the calculation, that's a drop of 74 points right here. 0.6 units extra, drop the blood sugar 74. One unit drops the blood sugar 104. That means the ISF is about 100 to 110. Let's see, can we see that again? Let's just go over it one more time. This is a closed loop system that increased, automatically increased the basal rate uh, here for only 20 minutes effectively giving an extra 0.6 units of insulin on top of the running basal rate back here. And the 0.6 dropped it from 160 to 86. And that's how we can calculate the, the, the ISF uh, for this one. So again, even though this wasn't a completely pure event, but it was helpful in calculating the ISF uh, and making, uh, making a note of that. And we look at two or three other events. And if we come up with the same result, we can, we can competently say that the ISF should be about 100 to 110, at least at this point of the day again. That I've convinced you that interpreting diabetes data can be rewarding and fun. I actually love it. Uh, and it's become more science than art. You know, we used to think that managing type one diabetes and adjusting insulin is more of an art than a science. But now I think that's not true because we have the data. And if we look deep in the data and we spend the time, we'll actually, there's a science to it. It's not just art.